Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I've, I've been up since 4 a.m. your time, so if, if I get through this at all, it's a minor miracle. But I'm very glad to be here. I think I had, the last time I was in Los Angeles was about 11 years ago, so it's been quite a while. Very glad to be out here, especially because this is the weekend before, like, like two days before, my family and I are, are taking a two-day trip to get from Topeka, Kansas to Auburn, Alabama. I'm spending a couple months at the Ludwig von Mises Institute over the summer. Right? Of course, we all know it's the best place in the world. And I'm not even joking, it really is the best place in the world. And of course, you know, we're leaving in a couple of days, so it's, in, you know, you have to pack. We have four little kids, you know, under age eight. They're all girls, by the way. And we got to pack for them for two months. And on the critical weekend before the trip, well, Tom's got to go to Los Angeles. Sorry, sorry to my wife. Sorry, I mean, it, it was completely by accident that this event was scheduled, or, or was it really? Maybe perhaps subconsciously I got the heck out of there. I want to start off talking to you guys by telling you a little something about something I did last year that some of you know about, and I want to reflect on it a bit before getting into any more information, and that is a video that I made that some of you have perhaps seen uh, called Interview with a Zombie. Now, if you, I'm talking, now, if you have not seen this, I'm going to ask you to do me one personal favor. You, you guys don't owe me any favors, but uh, if you ever need me to do something, you just give me a call. <laughs> but go to the website interviewwithazombie.com. Best seven bucks I ever spent was buying that domain name. Even if you've seen the video, by the way, go to interviewwithazombie.com and you'll also get to see the blooper tape, which is much funnier than the actual video. But the idea, the premise behind Interview with a Zombie is that there's a zombie who has his own television talk show on which he interviews authors. So imagine that, a zombie having his own show, how different that is from our normal television. <laughs> so my friend and I, of course the zombie is played by economist uh, Bob Murphy, he has a PhD from New York University. Super sophisticated guy, but obviously has no self-respect whatsoever. Dresses up, dresses up as a zombie at the drop of a hat. I didn't even ask him. I just mentioned the idea. I was actually sitting at lunch table with people saying, "Gosh, I'm just, you know, I'd love to do this. I had this idea for a skit to talk about nullification. I just need somebody to play the zombie." And Bob is sitting there going, "Come on! I mean, my gosh, I'd step over my own grandmother for the opportunity to play a zombie, and I don't even know what you're asking me for." So the idea that we came up with was that the zombie would be able to say only one word at a time. <laughs> so in order to kick off the interview with me, naturally, he holds up the book and says, Book. <laughs> right, that's right. As you'll see from the blooper tape, the first two times he did this, I could not hold it together. <laughs> All right, so then I go on, explain what the book is about, and then the idea is that the whole rest of the interview is him throwing these sort of politically correct accusations at me. You know, oh, the, you, know, the, you know, slavery. And I had to go, no, actually, slavery, nullification was never used to defend slavery, as we saw in the, the video, right? I mean, even though Rachel Maddow deliberately tries to confuse you. I, I know, this is a night of surprises, isn't it? <laughs> Rachel Maddow deliberately tries to confuse you by saying the pro-slavery John C. Calhoun supported nullification. So, of course, you know what that means. It's all about slavery. Well, of course, it was not. What, what would the southern states have needed nullification for with regard to slavery? What anti-slavery laws would they have needed to nullify? Like, the argument doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> all right, so I go on and explain to the zombie that it was never used to defend slavery, and it was in fact used to fight against the fugitive slave laws. And isn't that, isn't that neat? I'm going to put these here. If I forget them, somebody remind me. My glasses are down here. So after I answer that objection, he then moves on to another objection. Well, racism. I, I know, I, I bet nobody in this room has ever been accused of racism because you support the powers of the states against the federal government, right? But I never heard this before. But that's the zombie's argument. So again, I have to explain this. No, obviously there's no necessary connection between these things, no logical connection. And then it just goes on, and then he just starts recycling the words that I've already addressed, he just goes back to. So the point is, he has no substantive arguments. The idea is just to smear me out of existence. To use these magic words 
that throw you out of the discussion entirely, that toxify you, that make you radioactive in our society. But every single time he makes an argument, so to speak, or utters a word, I've got all these facts and substantive responses, and it doesn't matter. You make no progress with the zombie. <laughs> now, the point of the video should be obvious, that if I were to go on with, you know, Rachel Maddow or Chris Matthews or any of these people, the experience I would have would be exactly like what I had with the zombie, except they wouldn't have the excuse of actually being a zombie. <laughs> In fact, you know, on YouTube, you can type in zombie and stuff, and you can find funny videos about what to do if zombies take over America. And, and my question is, how would we tell the difference? <laughs> All right. So that was a promo for nullification. And it's got, like, you know, a whole bunch of views, like people viewing this thing. People, people uh, have supported it quite a bit. I was very happy about that. But it's making a larger point here. I mean, ha, 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 but it's making a larger point. First, strategically, it helped, because before people could smear me with those words, I'm already laughing at them. So that now when they do try to smear me, well, then all my friends just go on their blogs, and in the comments section, they link to the zombie video. So it's great, seven bucks! <laughs> Plus, you know, I mean, people did help me out with the video and so on, but. That was really great for me, in that it made it easier to push an idea that is totally out of the so-called mainstream. And secondly, this idea of the mainstream, or extremism, and we get this all the time, my goodness, you people are extremists, because you think that if the federal government violates the Constitution, that maybe we shouldn't do that thing. And this is extremism. And extremism is another one of these words that's used to shut down discussion. I mean, what, you want to be an extremist? What's wrong with you? No, 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 no. You want to be in the mainstream. The mainstream runs from Hillary Clinton to Mitt Romney. So it's about a three-inch area, pretty much. Like this from right here to like here. That's where you want to be. And of course, the point of the video is that in our society, if you want to talk about a real substantive issue, that alone makes you an extremist. Because if you were part of the mainstream, you'd be satisfied with the completely trivial issues they want us to talk about. Should the top marginal, thank you. Well, should the top marginal tax rate be 39.5 or 35%? Which one should it be? It, which of two possible ways should the federal government loot us every year? You know, they could loot us by taking this part of our property, or they could loot us by taking another part. Discuss. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we should. But those of us who say, you know what, I don't like the way the deck is being stacked in these. I find these questions completely creepy and totally beside the point. Where do you, how do you answer that question if you don't happen to like being expropriated in the first place? There is no answer for you. You're outside. You're an extremist. Ooh, ooh, ooh. An extremist just means you disagree with both Hillary Clinton and Mitt Romney. That's all it means. <laughs> but it's an, it's an attempt to shut down debate. And the way you respond to that is, first of all, of course, by refusing to be intimidated. And secondly, by laughing at them. Oh, man, have I had a blast with this zombie thing. Because now all these people who come after me, now they all have to say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not being a zombie here, now just wait one second. The fact that they even have to say this is a great victory. Moreover, if we're ever discouraged in this battle, just remember, and if, if you haven't seen it, you can go to YouTube and find it, <clears throat> remember the beauty of the look on Chris Matthews' face on, on MSNBC when the subject of nullification came up. I mean, it was like the return of Godzilla to this guy. Just that look, that look of sheer terror that maybe, just maybe, an idea that the mainstream has not approved for us, the mainstream media, the mainstream political class has not approved for us in advance, is taking root anyway. Maybe they are losing their domination over our minds. This led him to this expression of sheer terror. Yeah, it's about time. I made the terrible mistake of abandoning my water. 
I'm extremely dehydrated today, so I'm going to take a little, little break here. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. <laughs> I forgot to give you a topic. The whole discussion could be one word. All right, just very quickly, because a lot of you already know this, so I'm going to go the, the quick, like, uh, let's see if I can do this in three minutes. Not the whole rest of the talk. <laughs> no, no, no such one. But the three-minute overview of nullification. You ready? Because we all basically have the gist of this, but I want to give it you know, a full, formal presentation. Here we go. Here's the idea behind state nullification. First, as we saw in that video, which of course stole half of my remarks, thank you John Bush and Jason Rink for nothing. <coughs> it comes from Thomas Jefferson, and even before that, it comes from the state ratifying convention of um, Richmond, Virginia in 1788. And I talk about this in the book Nullification. Now, even if you don't know what nullification is, you see a book that has the word nullification stamped over the faces of Obama, Pelosi, and Harry Reid, you say, well, whatever this thing is, I think I'm probably in favor. <laughs> in, these, in 1798, Jefferson and Madison draft the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, respectively. In, the, in these resolutions, we see it spelled out what the powers of the states are in situations like this, when the state is responding to a federal law that violates the Constitution, or a federal measure that violates the Constitution. What should the states do? Well, the states should refuse to enforce this. And I give evidence that you know, there is uh, good constitutional grounds for, for, uh, for believing this, and I, I won't go into all this tonight because I'm doing the, the quick version. But the, the bottom line of this is that Jefferson said that nullification is the rightful remedy. And James Madison said that the parties to the Constitution, he said this in his famous report of 1800, in the last resort have got to have some way to check the federal government when all three branches betray us, even the holy judicial branch, which is supposed to be infallible and once the judges have spoken, we're all supposed to bow down and shut our mouths. Even then, says Madison, we need to be able to resist. Madison said in, in the Virginia Resolutions of 1798 that the states were duty bound to resist when the federal government violated the Constitution. Now, later on in his life, later on he said different things. And so people say, aha, well in 1830 when he was 103, he changed his mind or whatever. I addressed that on pages 288 to 290. So I'm gonna <laughs> leave, leave you with that. But when we talk about this, the logic of it basically runs as follows. Just a few steps. Number one, in the American system, no government is conceived of as being sovereign. And by sovereign, I mean having ultimate decision-making power. We sometimes talk about state sovereignty, but that's just shorthand for the sovereignty of the peoples of the states. No government is sovereign. That's the old world European model that Americans fled from. It's the peoples of the states who are sovereign, and in their sovereign capacity, they apportion powers between the state governments and the federal government. And in so doing, they don't give up their sovereignty, they are merely exercising their sovereignty. They remain, or they retain ultimate decision-making power. So if the agent that they themselves created, namely the federal government, should go beyond the powers granted to it by the sovereign peoples of the states, then the very logic of the system demands that the sovereign peoples of the states, by virtue of being sovereign, have to have a last resort mechanism for intervening when their own system perverts its instrument, namely the Constitution. That's the logic of it. So it doesn't matter that a bunch of, you know, that the Supreme Court, you know, once or twice has said, hey, you're not allowed to do this. That's totally beside the point. The point is that the logic of the system demands it. The system makes no sense otherwise. And that's what I'm elaborating on uh, in the book and in some of my other, my other stuff. Okay, so that's kind of my... I did it! I did it! Ha! I did it. Three minutes. Okay. The federal government said Jefferson cannot have a monopoly on determining what its own powers are because we all know what it's going to do. It's going to suddenly determine that it has more and more and more and more and more powers. It's going to keep on discovering these vast, untapped reservoirs of power. We all know this. I mean, this, ha this has happened. It's not like I'm talking theory up here. Just look, around, look at the Constitution, then look at what we live under. This is what has happened. So it's not enough to say, well, gee, you know, it would be nice if they would listen to the Constitution, then the government would be more limited. Yes, it would be nice. 
A lot of things would be nice. But power has to counteract power. You can't expect the Tenth Amendment to enforce itself. The states have to assert themselves. That's the idea behind state nullification. That maybe, maybe there aren't going to be national solutions to the problems we're facing. Maybe they have to be bottom-up instead of top-down solutions. Maybe. Maybe we're just feeding a monster when we keep looking for, for national solutions. Now, having said this, the constitutional arguments that have been raised against nullification, I take on here, and so I, I, won't, uh, I won't tire you with those. And what I'm trying to do is to recover some lost U.S. history. I mean, to learn about what the states used to get away with against the federal government. It's incredible. I mean, the federal government has spent at least the past century enjoying itself at our expense, enjoying all the things that it can get away with at our expense. That's why it's so enjoyable and cathartic to see what the states were doing in the name of freedom against the federal government. But having said that, I want to emphasize that the fact that a crummy law violates the Constitution, well, you know, that's bad, and I'm, I'm sorry about that, and I'm against that. But the real problem is that the law is evil and immoral in the first place, Constitution or not. And we have to focus on, because oftentimes we get, we get bogged down with focus, I mean, and the Constitution, that's great. If the Constitution is an argument that you can appeal to with your friends to get them to agree with you about limiting government, you know, you have my blessing, let's go use it. But ultimately, it's a question of right and wrong, good and evil. And it, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> now, of course, as I indicated at the beginning, we're not, we're not allowed to have these thoughts citizen. You understand that? We're not allowed to have these thoughts. Confine yourselves to the range of debate that is allowed to you on the pages of the New York Times. That is what we, we, your overlords, will determine for you the range of allowable debate. We, have, we will determine for you. How dare you uppity people think you have some voice in determining the range of debate? That's been the attitude. And so we have this problem of thought controllers in our society who use demonizing, toxifying words like extremism, or they introduce slavery to scare people away when it has, not only does it have zero to do with nullification, it's exactly the opposite. When, when, when South Carolina seceded from the Union, December 20th, 1860, one of its complaints was that the North was nullifying the fugitive slave laws. Now that's the opposite of what every school kid thinks he knows about nullification, if he's even been taught what the word means. We're not allowed to have these thoughts. No, 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 citizen. <clears throat> and yet, what does this mean? What does it mean when they call us extremists? Well, you notice what they don't use the word extremism for. They don't use it to describe what the federal government does. You never hear the thought controllers. And when I say thought controllers, I'm thinking about, you know, the MSNBCs, even the Fox News sometimes. Uh, I'm thinking about... Media Matters, you know, this left-wing media watchdog group that monitors all television to make sure nobody utters an unapproved thought. Uh, I'm thinking about the, the misnamed website Think Progress, which I mean, I think of it as more like Think Zombie, or, or because it's bankrolled by George Soros, Think Soros is another possibility. But notice that it is not considered to be extremism when the TSA is sticking its hands down our pants. Nothing extreme about that. That's just public policy, citizen. Shut your mouth. So that's not extremism. It, by definition, it's not. Because it falls between Hillary and Mitt. So how could it be extreme, right? These are, the, these are the great statesmen of our day. They're going to be remembered for centuries and centuries on. You know, there'll, there'll be a, a Plutarch someday who will write the lives of these people. Or how about the fact that our entitlement programs are underfunded by an amount more than double the GDP of the entire world. You and I didn't do that. That wasn't our policy. That's the mainstream. That's the non-extreme people. No, you and I are the extreme ones. You and I are the ones who say, now, whoa, 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 I'm pretty sure you're not gonna be able to pay that off. Now that's, now come on now. Somebody. Now listen. My gosh. Now I, I don't want to make this all about myself, but I am going to share a little something about my experiences. Um, I, of course, when you, know, you write a book called Nullification, 
and you're talking about the powers of the states, you know what's going to happen to you. Okay, we, I knew this going, going into it. I knew I was going to be called all kinds of names, and people were going to accuse me of having bad motives, and I'm a bad guy, and I just want to oppress people. Yeah, because the best strategy for oppressing people is first try the almost insuperable task of resurrecting a completely toxified historical concept called nullification. First try to do that, then get it accepted over the heads of all the media people in the whole country and against the entire political class, then go to step two. Yeah, that seems like the most effective. I mean, it doesn't even make sense, even if that were, that were what I was doing. But I knew this was going to happen, and there's no way to disprove this. Because, because they're going to, you know, they can read my mind, and they know what I'm really up to, and so on. And so, you know, I've been, I've been called some rotten names, and I've had some terrible attacks on me, and it's, it's made me thicker skin, but, but more importantly, the experience has actually made me a better person. Literally, in the sense that, for one thing, and I'll be honest with you, I used to, when I, was, when I was younger and I would write stuff, I would criticize books I hadn't even read. Because, you know, I knew the author was a jerk, and I'd heard about the book, so it's probably stupid and whatever. Now, come on now, let's be honest. You're going to tell me you have never criticized a book you haven't read? I mean, come on. I, like, everybody read Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance? Come on. We have all done this. <laughs> and they did it to me. Not just with this book, but with other ones. They did it to me. They said terrible things about me. They sometimes said the opposite of things that I said. The complete opposite. So they obviously hadn't read it. And I just decided at that moment, I'm not doing this anymore. I mean, they can treat me this way, and they can act like this, but I'm not going to be like this anymore. I'm not going to treat people like garbage. I'm not going to refuse to give them the courtesy of, you know, I mean, look, it's a huge, huge, unbelievable undertaking to write a book. I mean, you at least owe the author that, that you at least read his thing before you go out and connect. So I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to criticize somebody on the basis of two or three totally uncharacteristic quotations from 15 years ago, as if that's who this person is. I'm not doing that to people anymore. I used to do that. And that's childish and pathetic. And I'm not going to be that person. And that's what I learned from having gone through this. That, yeah, they're going to keep doing that to me. But at least I can live well and I can sleep at night. And this has been an important experience for me. And I will say also that some of the attacks on me have been so vicious and so high profile that it, 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 it occurred to me years ago that it was very likely that at some point, and I'm saying this not to get sympathy, but it occurred to me that at some point probably they would get to be so great that I would basically be abandoned. That basically people would say, this guy's too much of a liability, we gotta just move on. And I, I would've been okay with that, you know I mean? I, I did my duty as I saw it, and I would've been okay with that. And yet it hasn't happened, because everyone has stuck by me, and I wanna thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Now what's interesting about the thought controllers, is that uh, I mean, many of the thought controllers are on the left, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, you know, in my opinion. But what genuine progressive really thinks Joe Biden is anything other than a shill for the establishment? I mean, come on, right? A real progressive dislikes Joe Biden as much, as, much as, as we do. A real progressive would be opposed, as a constitutionalist is, to the Patriot Act, to the misuse of the National Guard, to the unconstitutional interference with the use of medical marijuana. And incidentally, when that case went before the Supreme Court, it was three of the most conservative states in the Union that stood with, with uh, Angel Rach on that issue. It was Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And now, you know, listen, I wouldn't want to be caught with a joint in Alabama. <laughs> okay. But their argument was, yeah, we don't like California's law, but that's what a federal system is, you know? It, it's not some kind of nationalist nightmare where there's one policy and we're just going to shove it down your throats. No, it's live and let live. So what if Alabama is different from California? Good. Okay, good. So what if Vermont is different from Idaho? So what? That's what America is. So a progressive would support, uh, the old style progressive uh, in the new left tradition believes small is beautiful and that meant not just business enterprise, 
but it meant also political units, that it's dehumanizing to have 309 million people being infallibly governed by one city. This is insane, and yet no one can even question that, because if you question that, you're an extremist, because Hillary doesn't question that, Mitt Romney doesn't question that. Don't ask this question, citizen, and there goes small is beautiful. What happened to small is beautiful? Is 309 million people small? Is that the exact right coming down from heaven scale of political order? 309 million to one? Is that how it works? Or how about what the TSA does to us? How about them sticking their hands down our pants? Or you have to worry about if I'm going to travel with children, I either have my kid irradiated or groped? This is the choice they're giving us. There's no progressive worth his salt that would disagree with that. And yet, why have so few of them stood with us? Why have so few of them said, no, this is so bad that, yes, we're even willing to stand with some of these Tenth Amendment people? <laughs> I mean, the TSA is even worse than that. At least the Tenth Amendment people aren't sticking their hands down my pants. That's one thing I can say for them. <laughs> Where are they? They're nationalists. They are stuck in the nationalist mold. Every issue has one solution. And if you dissent from that, if you are a dissident, well, you know the words they'll use. Now, they claim that the reason they won't stand with us is they're so concerned about the fate of minorities. They're just deeply concerned. They're always losing sleep about this and so on and so forth because they're such humanitarians. Now, I, I have no, I, I will take them at their word because I do believe there are people of goodwill who are being honest, who genuinely are concerned that there could be violations of civil rights at the state and local level. So I don't want to make light of that. That can be a genuine concern. And I stand up here as somebody who holds no brief for the states, per se. The states are run by insane sociopaths half the time, too. Which is... why I favor nullification, because at least we can put them to some good use, have them do something for us. But when we think back about, you know, people will say, well, in the civil rights movement, didn't they use nullification rhetoric? And of course, yes, they did. They did use nullification rhetoric. But there are a couple things to remember here. Now again, first, as somebody who I describe myself as a libertarian, I look at what was going on in the southern states in the 1950s, and I see a state offense against human dignity, because look at what was going on. Remember the Rosa Parks episode, of course. Now, Rosa Parks, we all remember the, uh, the, the bus boycott. But in 1943, an episode most people don't remember, Rosa Parks, well, let's, let's remember, by the way, that when, when we say that the blacks had to sit at the back of the bus, it wasn't that you would get on the bus and then you would walk toward the back. You would get on the bus, put your coin in, then get back out and then go to the back door and get in. So Rosa Parks one day, it's a rainy day, she gets in, she puts her coin in, she gets back out, goes to the back, and the bus drives away. So it's not enough that she has to live under this, now they have to treat her like an animal. So then, in the mid-50s, now she has her opportunity, she gets on board the bus on that fateful day, it's the same bus driver who left her in the rain 12 years earlier. So now, of course, the, the argument is, well, I mean, this is a, you know, this city bus monopoly and these ordinances are, you know, state, <clears throat> state enterprises. I mean, it seems like we're entitled to being treated with dignity here. And when they boycott the buses, they're trying to think of al alternative ways to arrange transportation. So, all right, some people will take people in their cars. And then there's an attempt to crack down on that because you don't have a license to do that, to, to cart people around. So again, it's a state of, I mean, what are these people supposed to do? So I, I think it's entirely right to have sympathies for the, I mean, so it's not that people think, well, you just don't care what was going on. I do care. But what was the remedy in that situation? Like, how did they get in that situation? And the answer, of course, is that it wasn't the court cases that turned things around. The court cases did not turn things around. Uh, yeah, there were some mild consequences. The thing that turned things around was when the 15th Amendment began to be enforced with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Then suddenly, a lot of these problems began to go away. So to compare 2011 with Birmingham 1963 is not fair, and it's not a reasonable comparison. 
In the same way that the neoconservatives think every single second is Munich 1938, the progressives think it's always Birmingham 1963. It's not. And for 30 years, blacks have been moving to the south in huge numbers. Things are completely different today, so it is wrong of them to cite this. And again, as I noted in that documentary, think of what the most lethal institution in the world for minorities has been. And it's not decentralized power or a federal system. Now, ever since Thomas Hobbes, ever since Hobbes in his book Leviathan, we have been taught that the way human beings have to organize themselves politically is in one irresistible power center, and there is no subsidiary body in society that has any prior liberties that cannot be abridged or canceled by that central authority. This is the starting point for political organization in the Western world, uh, certainly since the French Revolution. And we think that's the only way to live, right? You can't have one area doing something different from another area. You can't have institutions within a larger institution that have liberties of their own. But that's exactly how European society was organized until basically the, 16th, or the 17th or 18th centuries. There were multiple power centers, and that's what allowed society to avoid totalitarianism. If you had had a Hitler or Stalin in the 17th century, they could not have done the damage they did. As, as murderous as they were, they wouldn't have had the authority to do it because they were much too hemmed in by competing power centers. When we hear all these titles that, that kings had centuries ago, he's the king of so-and-so, and the protector of this, and the, that wasn't because he was vain. That was a recognition that there were bodies under his care that preceded him, that had liberties that came before his prerogatives, and that he was bound to respect. We don't have that anymore. That's all gone. Now what we have is there's one single flat plane, there's no subsidiary body that can stand up to the center, and what have the results been? Have the results been uh, fantastic bouts of liberty breaking out everywhere around the world? Or has it been totalitarian revolutions, total war, unpayable debts, crushing burdens, growing bureaucracies? I mean, you know, I think the question answers itself. And yet, and yet, the misnamed progressives look at this structure and say, yep, that's the best and only way to organize society, and anyone who dissents from that must be some kind of an extremist. These are the people who had the nerve to use the expression question authority. When was the last time these people questioned anything they were fed? Anything. Now look, there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons that we might all be here. Some people might be here out of a devotion to the cause of health freedom in various forms, whether it's freedom from the so-called Obamacare. I hate that word, by the way. Um, you know, various other forms of health freedom. There could be people who are devoted to the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. There could be people who are just dedicated to the principle that it's, it's better for there to be multiple power centers in society, for people to have greater voice in the regime they live under, whatever. There are all different reasons. But I want to spend my last few moments just sharing with you what my own are. And my own basically are these, are both domestic and foreign. Domestically, I've come to the conclusion that the federal government has sold us a bill of goods and they've brainwashed us into believing it. Ever since we were sitting in their crummy schools, they fed us this line that without them, we'd be totally lost, we'd be pathetic boobs, we'd all be eating poison food, we would, with all our technological advances, we wouldn't have thought of any way to, to come up with a, uh, a non-lethal sandwich. <laughs> our kids would all be working in a mine for a dollar a day, we'd all be getting our limbs blown off because our computer monitors would be exploding. <laughs> Everybody would earn three cents an hour. Uh, there'd be no science, there'd be no art, and on and on and on, right? Everybody would be an ignoramus and this and that, right? I mean, everybody, everybody was taught this. I understand why people believe this. There's a superficial plausibility to it because you say, well, before we had a lot of government intervention, people lived in terrible conditions. Now they live in better conditions, so the one must have caused the other. That's completely illegitimate uh, uh, reasoning, and I, I think I could I try to demonstrate that in my newer book, Rollback. But the point is that if we were educated in, this is my new analogy, I, I kind of like, I'm kind of fond of, I'm very bad at analogies. I'm the anti-Peter Schiff when it comes to analogies. I'm so bad at it. 
he, he thinks of analogies in his sleep, you know, he could be drunk, you know, you know, car accident, he's coming up with analogies, I can't think of anything. But imagine you were educated in Walmart schools, schools run and funded by Walmart. Well, the kids, now, I suppose in these schools, every, every day the kid goes to this classroom, and the classroom, up on the wall, it's all pictures of Walmart CEOs looking down upon the kids wisely. And the kids are taught to sing songs, oh, how great the Walmart CEOs are. And, oh, God bless the Walmart CEOs, we'd all be pathetic boobs without them. And so, I mean, on and on and on, they cut out little pictures of the Walmart CEOs. And then one day a year, they get to stay home from school and meditate on the great contributions of the Walmart CEOs, whatever. Wouldn't we, in that situation, wouldn't we say, now that's a little bit creepy, you know, like, I mean, come on. I mean, maybe there were a couple of good Walmart CEOs, but I mean, I, I refuse to believe that all good things of civilization came from these people. Like, we would say that. Yet, when it's U.S. presidents up on that wall, we accept everything they tell. Oh, my gosh, heaven forbid, what kind of a caveman are you? You mean you don't want the great innovations of President so-and-so? Where would we be? We'd all be dead in a ditch and have no limbs and three cents down. I mean, it's like a mental disorder. And, and, and like somehow it's been talked to. I, I don't know. How, it's, it's an incredible racket. It is an unbelievable racket. I mean, in a way, I almost wish I was clever enough to have thought of it. <laughs> but I would loot you people. I would loot and expropriate you people. And then to add insult to injury, I would train your kids to cheer what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, man, I mean, that is serious, serious sociopathic cleverness. How do they think of this stuff? So I don't believe it. I believe this institution has held back human progress. I believe it pits us all against each other in a civil war of everybody grabbing. And every one of us has been sucked into some kind of interest group, whether it's our occupation, or our age, or our race, or our class. Everybody wants to grab and grab and grab and grab. It's what Frederick Bastiat said. The state is the great fiction by which everyone attempts to live at the expense of everyone else. And look at where it's got. <laughs> However, my last uh, section here is something that maybe not all of you are going to receive well. But, you know, I, I can't, I gotta be me, you know, okay? I gotta tell you. And the other thing, the other thing is, so, so in other words, because of this, I believe this institution is like a de-civilization agent. So at every turn, I want to try and stop it. And if this is a tool for doing it, then I'm all for it. But it's worse than that, because, you know, I, let me start off by saying, giving my, my right-wing credentials here. I was the vice president of the Harvard College Republicans. Now, I know you're all thinking, yeah, that's some right-wing credential. <laughs> Wow, so you supported Walter Mondale? Great. <laughs> ah, okay, the older crowd remembers Walter Mondale. Good, that joke wasn't lost on people. Okay, my politically incorrect guide to American history is one of the best-selling books in the history of the conservative book club. I mean, like, so I'm not some left, I'm not a commie, I, I'm not a, you know, pinko or anything like that. I'm the least commie guy you'll ever meet, although there are a lot of pretty non-commie people in this room, I'll, I'll say, of course. But having said that, I also came to the conclusion that I don't believe the foreign policy either. I just don't believe them. I don't believe the words are And I say this to people knowing, again, that some of you are going to disagree with me, but I'm telling you I'm not a leftist in any way, and I came to the conclusion that they're lying sociopaths domestically, and they don't magically transform into angelic beings when it comes to foreign policy. They're also lying to us there. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some nasty people around the world. I mean, there's no need to caricature what I'm saying. But I think back to the 1990s when I was, you know, well, younger than I am now, and, and, and I, I basically believe that, well, I'm a good little conservative, and so, you know, when, when the authorities tell me that military action is necessary, only a pinko commie would question that. <laughs> now, that was a big, big moral mistake I made, an intellectual mistake, and I'm sorry I made it. And I think back up to the disgraceful ways I used to make up excuses for these people. They would do, commit horrific atrocities, and they would do it on the most flimsy pretext. I mean, the arguments they made for some of these wars were so transparent. I thought, how could, I, I began to think, how can a conservative, really, who's supposed to be dedicated to Western civilization and reason and on and on, be swept up in this? I mean, it's so beneath us to fall for some of this stuff. 
And yet I fell for it, and, and I would go around searching for corroborating evidence to support their lies. And if, if I had seen a poor Russian in the Soviet Union doing the same thing, saying, oh no, saying to his neighbors, no, 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 what Pravda is telling us is true. Look, I've been looking it up, and I've looked at all this evidence I found. I would have treated that person with contempt. But for some reason, when it was my looting expropriators, it was okay for me to make excuses for them and to search out corroborating evidence for arguments that they had abandoned. They themselves said they weren't even making these arguments anymore, and I was still looking for ways to defend them. And I finally just decided, and this was back in the early 1990s, uh, after the first Persian Gulf War. Now, this is a war a lot of people thought was just, nothing wrong with it, you know, Saddam's a bad guy, he's massing his troops on the Saudi border, and so on and on. <clears throat> but I remember hearing about people, hundreds of thousands of people retreating, being incinerated, and I'm being asked to have a Bob Hope special to celebrate this. Some, some backward country, some backwater, which actually by regional standards was relatively advanced, hardly. <laughs> but relatively speaking, a modern healthcare system and so on and so forth. So I, I thought to myself, what's happening to me? What have I allowed this institution to do to me that I could look so callously on these poor people? I don't care that they were conscripted into an army. They were conscripted, most of them, and I don't, I don't care that the sociopaths in D.C. have told me I'm supposed to hate these people because I don't hate them. And when I saw that I was supposed to, if there had been an earthquake over there, we would all be tears and pity about it. But when they're incinerated alive, nothing. These people are human garbage. And I just decided at that point, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't believe what you people are telling me. I don't believe your phony baloney reasons for your wars, that all you care about is democracy, so that therefore you can put the Emir of Kuwait back on his throne. I mean, come on. You know, I'm not seven years old. In fact, that's an insult, because my seven-year-old is smarter than that. I have sometimes said, by the way, that I, I managed to explain to my seven-year-old what nullification meant. And it made me conclude that a panel of seven-year-olds would be better than the Supreme Court and the Federal Reserve Board put together. So let me finish, because I know I'm, I'm way, way, way over. Way, way, way over. But also, also, as the 1990s progressed, okay, so then we've got the sanctions regime on Saddam. And the UN, okay, we, all, we don't like the UN, neither do I. The UN says 500,000 children have died of malnutrition because of the, the sanctions. And then the usual response is, well, that's a phony statistic, or if Saddam hadn't spent all his money on palaces, the kids could have eaten or whatever. That's neither here nor there. The point is, US officials, Madeleine Albright and Bill Richardson, both said they did not question that figure. They said that price was worth it. They didn't say, the UN is lying, they didn't say this is awful. They said that price is worth it. Now, I am sorry, there is impossible for a conservative who's supposed to, who lectures the world about moral relativism to say, I mean, what? We are better than this. How can we allow ourselves to be so dehumanized that we sit here and allow ourselves to be called extremists when people who make excuses for, for the killing of half a million children to go about their business and, and we, we defend this. This is public policy. No, I can't do this. <laughs> now, incidentally, Incidentally, Russell Kirk is considered by some to be the founder of modern American conservatism. His classic book, The Conservative Mind, is probably in like a ninth edition by now. A very significant figure. And we look at Kirk's foreign policy, it has nothing in common with the teenage laptop bombardiers who run our foreign policy today. It has nothing to do with the neocon Bill Kristol, nothing. You look, at, you look at Russell Kirk, who's a real conservative, who hasn't had his brain washed by these phonies on the radio. Kirk said that military conscription is akin to slavery. This is, a, this is the most significant conservative thinker of the 20th century. In his book, 1954, called A Program for Conservatives, he laid out a foreign policy that bears zero resemblance to the interventionism that we have now. And at the end of the Persian Gulf War, at the end of the Persian Gulf War, he said that George H.W. Bush, now this is the most significant conservative thinker of the 20th century, 
He said George H.W. Bush should be strung up on the White House lawn for war crimes. Was he a pinko commie, Russell Kirk? Is that what we're gonna, is that what we're reduced to? No. Now finally, therefore, my conclusion is, it is not enough to say that in Washington we've got some bumblers and boy, they're inefficient. And there are some libertarians who sort of take that tack, that gosh, you know, government's just full of these people who have, they, they have these programs with all these crazy unintended consequences. What a bunch of jokers. <laughs> I don't go for that. It's not that they're jokers. It's that they are raving sociopaths whom I don't want have exercising any power yeah. over. Yeah. And if we at the state level, if we in our own communities, if we can't solve our problems face to face with each other without the intervention of these people, then heaven help us. The state. But especially these modern megastates have been a moral and material disaster. Now, being here and, of course, you know, in this type of room, there are people of all different points of view. And sometimes people wonder, you know, well, maybe there are some people on the left who are so disaffected on some critical issues that maybe they'll join with us. And in some areas, and here I am, I'm the squariest of the square. I've never smoked pot. I've never done any of this stuff. Not, I, you know, I got four kids. We do all, I got a minivan. You know, I, I'm not part of this. But I feel like I have more in common with somebody like, in the 60s, a Carl Oglesby, who said that the old right, which is the right wing that I'm talking about, has been totally decimated, and the new left are in many ways morally and politically coordinate. I'm sympathetic to the new left historian, William Appleman Williams, who said that, the best approximation we ever came in this country to having truly humane communities was under the Articles of Confederation. Now you utter these words, you say something like that to Bill Crystal, you may as well be holding a crucifix in front of Dracula. <laughs> now, are there alliances that are possible? Maybe. I mean, I did a book that I've got out there with a friend, friend Murray Polner, and he and I disagree on almost everything, but on critical things we came together and we, we produced, I think, a nice little, little product. I don't know what types of alliances are possible. All we can do is to hold aloft the banner of justice and humanity and see who rallies to it. And no matter who joins us, fight we must. For as Ludwig von Mises said, everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders. No one is relieved of his share of responsibility by others. And no one can find a safe way out for himself if society is sweeping toward destruction. Therefore, everyone, in his own interests, must thrust himself vigorously into the intellectual battle. None can stand aside with unconcern. The interest of everyone hangs on the result. Let's all stand together. Thank you very much.